and um, the materials will be shared on our website after the webinar. Uh, for dial in, the phone number's there. And please feel free to um, chat um, in the chat box if you have any questions or anything like that. We'll be getting to those at the end. And this webinar today is, is brought to you today by California School Based Health Alliance. And um, we uh, are a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of young kids. Um, and we have a membership. And if you're a member, you get exclusive benefits um, such as conference registration, tools and resources such as this webinar today, and technical assistance. If you want to sign up, there's our the website. Um, and so I'm going to share um, I'm gonna, our, uh, present our presenters um, today. Uh, we have uh, Vanessa Nutters with um, Roosevelt Health Center and La Clinica. She's the clinic supervisor. Um, she grew up in Oakland, California, just blocks from where Roosevelt Health Center is located and um, has returned to her neighborhood to continue supporting families and young people who currently reside in the community. She's a passionate advocate for youth and has a rich background in education and community health at the intersections of art and social justice. Since the age of 15, Vanessa's worked in the service of Oak, the Oakland community, organizing to ensure equitable access to resources and opportunities. Over the last five years, she's worked with in and in partnership with OUSD to uplift disenfranchised youth, provide mentorship, organize health science internships, and much, much more. Uh, she maintains a focus on families and youth who have been severely impacted by trauma and continues to advocate for trauma-informed practices in the classroom and is dedicated to building sustainable programming that provides community access to basic resources, including food, clothing, and healthcare. And we also have Sarah Taylor with us, and she's an integrated behavioral health clinician um, with La Clinica uh, School-Based Health Centers in Oakland. She brings over 10 years of experience working with children and families impacted by complex trauma, providing consultation and training to peer counselors, clinicians, and educators. Over the last four years, she's partnered with educators and administrators to create a model for training and development of school staff to equip them with the tools needed to design schools and classrooms as a place of healing and connection. She was born and raised near Chicago, Illinois, and is a licensed clinical social worker and received her master's of social work from Portland State University in 2012. And she's lived in Oakland for eight years, where she currently resides with her partner, preschoolers, preschooler, and abundance of houseplants. So we're so excited to have them with us today. Uh, thank you all for joining and okay, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen with you all. So some of you, I'm not sure if any of you um, attended our presentation at the um, at the conference. If you did, then some of this will be review, but we're just going to really quickly review um, where we've come from and then we'll really be spending the majority of our work today focused on um, what we're doing right now during the pandemic using this as a foundation, but we wanted to make sure that everyone kind of understood the, the foundations of our work and, and how we're building on it. Um, if you'd like, we'd love for everyone to just take a, a minute to respond to this poll. You can just type in um, I can also type it in the chat for you all. Um, <laughs> this is the weird thing. Huh? Um, go ahead and type in the chat or type in the poll, but your current school culture and climate. Um, It looks like from the, um, when we were in the conference, we had a lot of different responses, um, some positive, some feeling pretty tired. Um, so go ahead and respond to that. Um, but yeah, just uh, to, my name is Sarah Taylor. I'm a clinician I'm at La Clinica and I currently work at the Havens Court campus. Um, which is attached to CCPA, which is um, a 6 through 12 in Oakland. And I also am supporting um, students at Esquilita Met West. Um, and those, that's a K through 8, and then again a 9 through 12. So kind of supporting students across the 
the age spectrum. Um, and before this, I was working with Roosevelt um, and Vanessa over there at Roosevelt, which is a six through eight. And all of those are in Oakland, California. Um, yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, so my name is Vanessa. Uh, Thank you, Jessica and Sarah for the introductions. Um, I am, as Sarah mentioned, the supervisor over at Roosevelt. Um, since the pandemic, there's been um, a number of shifts in the in the agency and in, across school-based health centers. So like Sarah, I'm also supporting multiple sites right now. One of those sites is um, CCPA, um, Havens Court Health Center. And then I'm also on site at a different health center, um, located at Reach Ashland Youth Center, which is called Fuente Wellness um, and is also part of La Clinica. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to talk today about um, some of the adaptations we've been making um, to accommodate virtual learning. Um, as you all I'm sure are aware, it is a, a process. We're all learning still. Um, some of the things that we'll talk about today are still in the planning process for us, um, and we're trying our best to implement them across sites. Um, so we don't totally have it figured out, but definitely want to share um, our ideas, things that have worked so far, things that aren't going so well, and um, get feedback and questions from you all. So we're excited for that. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, yeah, we're just going to give a little bit of a foundation of where we come from and then we'll spend the majority of today talking about what to do in, in virtual, what we're doing in virtual and would love to hear from some of you as well. Um, and if any of you want to drop in the chat where you're joining us from, that would be great. So, you know, we're all trying to build connection and community in this virtual world. So we'd love to just see who y'all are representing and where you're coming from. If you wanna drop it in the chat and I'm gonna pass it over to Nessa to kind of take us through this first part. Yeah, so again, like Sarah said, we definitely wanted to give you guys a foundation of how this started. So it definitely didn't happen overnight. Um, I think now we're in the fifth year. Um, and so the foundation that we started with and our commitment was really to building a stronger community and connections within that community to foster resilience in our students um, and also in the larger community so that includes families adults um, staff at the schools um, and we really again just want young people to be able to build these connections not only with each other but with the adults in their life in order to strengthen the community um, and of course that as i mentioned there is um three groups that we focused on so educators families and the larger community and then students of course who are kind of the soul of the school um, and as we go through today it would be great if you all um, can think about these three groups at your own schools. Um, think about who's included, who's who might be left out, um, and what assets and opportunities exist within each group. And yeah, this is just I think a great quote that really grounds the grounds us in this work um, and uh, sort of brings us back to the importance. When there's genuine investment, resilience work becomes an integrated piece of school culture. Um, and that is our goal to help the school build this culture um, so that the work can sustain. Um, and how did we get here? So again, Sarah's gonna talk about um, these last five years and where we started and kind of the path to being able to establish and build these relationships within the school, um, primarily like buy-in from staff um, and allowing the clinic to establish. Um, and of course, a huge part of how we got here um, is our students. So just wanna take a moment to honor all of our young people. Um, they are of course a huge part of the reason we're in this work. Um, and Sarah, I'll pass it, pass it over to you. Yeah, great. So um, some of this might be review for those of you who joined us in the conference. So I'm not going to read through all of these, um, but we just wanted to bring in some voice from, from students um, 
we know that a, a lot of our students have experienced trauma in the past. We also know that we're currently in the midst of, of experiencing a lot of collective trauma from the pandemic, from um, structural racism, from the current sociopolitical climate. And so um, just really wanting to hold um, that, that and honor that and also honor the resilience and the resources and the, the strength that exists in the community that we serve. Um, we, so we pulled some of these quotes from folks, you can read through them. Um, and they really just speak to the, the students, you know, being impacted by their trauma and also not being being their trauma and that there's so much more to who they are and who they're bringing um, with them into a space, even when it's virtual. Um, and so we just wanted to honor that. So where we came from, um, let me share this so I can see my screen. So we were um, granted, we were given a grant back um, about five years ago to kind of do trauma-informed work at school. Like it, it was like, okay, now to form a trauma-informed like school culture. And so we had to really think about what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, in the beginning, I think there were a lot of, you know, individual ideas about like, oh, teachers just need more training about trauma or, um, you know, if we just, if we do X, Y, Z, then these three strategies will work. And what we really found is that this work is, um, what we know is that this work is really relational. Um, and so this has been a much longer process of um, integrating this at the foundation of our practice rather than recognizing it as interventions. And of course we have interventions that we use, um, but, but the thing that really creates a trauma-informed culture and a healing-centered culture is one in which we are relating to one another from a, from a space of healing rather than fear and um, trauma. And so for the first year of the grant, we focused entirely on relationship building and taking the temperature. I think the only thing that we did that year as a quote unquote intervention um, was we like started to pay for things for teacher wellness, like um, teacher breakfasts and, and things like that. And then in year two, we um, received another grant on top of it. And so we were able to really focus our attention um, more closely. Um, so that's where we began to assess what was going on. We strategized, we started implementing different prototypes. Um, in year three, we moved in toward um, creating um, leaders on campus. So really building into and um, supporting the kind of teachers, admin, support staff who were really leading this work anyways and giving them the space to be able to be together, to process with one another and to build the strategy strategies on top of what they were already doing in order to lead this work forward. Um, and then last year, really the focus was on sustainability. So educators leading that work, um, educators who'd been doing advanced training the year prior, then took on kind of the work of transforming school climate and culture around um, trauma. Um, there was some youth led work that happened and out of that year three work, some of the, what we identified as really needing to improve on was improving family engagement and recognizing that family engagement was very surface level um, and that we wanted to make it something that was more central to our work. And so that's something that happened as well. And then in the middle of year four, um, COVID-19 happened. And so now we are learning as we go and adapting. Um, to distance learning and, and to distance therapy and distance services generally. Um, so for assessment, for those of you who are gonna be in an assessment phase of building relationships, those are things that can still happen. Um, we There were some things that were informal and might be more difficult to do. Um, that was things like just walking the halls and building relationships and listening to people. We also used um, the SHAPE assessment um, for the TRSIA from SHAPE. Um, that's linked in this slide and I can also share it in the chat once I'm done sharing my screen. Um, and that covers several different areas of like what is a trauma-informed school. And we um, use that and then we just did, we've been doing trial and error a lot. <laughs> and especially this year with virtual adaptations, just a lot of trial and error and um, seeing what works and seeing what doesn't and learning from that. 
Um, so when we did the TRSIA, what, what initially people thought was that we were going to want to do more targeted trauma programming and that teachers needed more training in trauma. And what actually came out of that when we, um, we did this assessment by asking for feedback from teachers, from admin, from security, from students, from support staff, like after school staff, and from clinicians on campus. And what came out of that is that, in fact, um, early intervention in the, the trauma programming, like, you know, trauma therapy work was happening and was happening well. And what was actually needed, um, teachers said, like, we understand what trauma is, but we don't know what to do with it. And so um, we focused a lot on classroom, st like, strategies for relating to students, um, trauma programming more as a school, like as a whole, um, and staff self-care. And staff self-care was actually the one that, that was the, like m the biggest like red flag. Like we, this is, we're drowning out here and we need something now. Um, and so we actually focused most of our attention for the first several years on staff self-care um, and like transforming, you know, vicarious trauma into something that could be like a healing space. Um, so like Nessa said, we've been working with three major groups. The, the one that we focused on first was educators. Um, just knowing that when our educators are not well, like we can't be asking them to be doing extra things. They're already spread really thin. That's even more um, true right now during the quarantine and um, while we're in distance learning. Educators are at the heart of our work. They are with the students more than any of the rest of people on campus are. Um, and so really focusing on, on those relationships was key. Um, some of those things included like when we were in person, we, did, we recreated the staff wellness room, we provided staff breakfast, we did incentivize wellness challenges. And that was not like if you exercise 30 minutes a day, that was Define for yourself what self-care looks like. Um, usually it fits into these categories of like play, rest, um, like, oh, I forget what the other ones were, you know, play, rest, movement, um, connection, and spend 30 a day, minutes a day doing literally anything that will be restorative for you. And, and then like put a star up there. Um, we really wanted to make sure that we were um, capturing that everybody's like tending to one's own needs looks different um, and it can shift and change every day and really incorporating that into the culture. We did process groups. Um, some of those were in response to incidents on campus. Some of those were in response to things that were happening um, in the country. And then, you know, some of those were just planned <laughs> and not in response to a specific traumatic event. Um, we also made sure that we always pay, we always pay teachers um, as much as we can. We incentivize and pay teachers for doing extra work and extra training. Um, it's really important that we recognize that the labor of educators should not come free, um, particularly when it's extra labor. So when we were asking them to come to two extra hours of training a month, plus like building new things into their curriculum, plus designing, you know, different spaces in their rooms that they really get paid for that work. Um, and so that's something that we focus our grant money on. Um, and yeah, we integrated them into trainings and in our, all of our different school-based health center activities. You can read through some of the strategies we used. And one of the ones we used a lot was Calm Corners that of course is changing right now um, because of COVID. Um, and then this uh, cohort where we really did um, advanced um, skill sharing and community building with a small group of educators. So that was um, between 12 and 15 staff who were the same 15 staff for the full year who came every month to participate in, in two hour workshops and then use what they learned in those workshops and try and practice them that month and then come back. Um, this is what we kind of landed on um, based on feedback from educators as the things that would make the most sense um, in designing the trainings. And then we also integrated, you'll see on here, there's nothing, there's not a bullet point that says like vicarious trauma. We didn't do a one-off vicarious trauma training. I have done those before just to like intro people to them. But in terms of creating like a healing centered cohort, we integrated that into every session rather than saying it one time at the beginning of the year and then continuing on. 
um, with our work. So in, in the two hour sessions, 30 minutes each time was dedicated specifically to uh, um, doing work um, mostly out of trauma stewardship. The books are trauma stewardship. And so now we're transitioning to telehealth and virtual wellness. I'm gonna pass over to Nessa. Um, it's gonna take us here. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. Um, here we have. Okay, so uh, as Sarah mentioned, we are now transitioning um, or have transitioned already to telehealth. Um, and right now what we're really trying to figure out in this fall semester of distance learning is what virtual wellness looks like. Um, so I just wanted to name that um, in navigating this transition, and I'm sure all of you have had a similar experience, there have been an incredible amount of disruptions um, to our normal clinic services and how we provide services to students. Um, so for us at Roosevelt, um, we had to, this happened, I think um, the schools closed March 13th um, and we had for this year, for that year, um, as part of our trauma-informed practice um, grants that we were receiving were uh, set to throw a health fair, I think on March 24th. Um, so that was a huge blow to us um, and something that the kids were really bummed about. Um, we had to cancel that. Um, along with that came um, budget and funding adjustments. Again, we had to transition all of our services to telehealth and figure out the best way to do that with students. Um, and it was really, and still is really a challenge getting a hold of students um, for telehealth appointments because we typically have access to them, right? We're on site, on school sites, and we can pull them from class or go hunt them down on campus if we're looking for them. And now it's really navigating, you know, how do we reach them? Um, and so um, we've uh, piloted a number of outreach efforts. Um, and right now we're starting to experiment with virtual engagement between the clinic and schools. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. I did want to mention um, that the cost team, which stands for coordination of services team, um, has been a huge part of us being able to access students during distance learning, especially at Roosevelt. Um, they have an incredibly strong team of leaders, which include administrators, um, the community school manager, teachers, uh, providers, not only from the health clinic, but also outside organizations who also allow us to have providers on campus, support staff attend, um, and then of course, health center staff. Um, they also have a referral system. So that has been key in allowing um, us and the health center to know how we can be of the best use um, and how we can be most helpful to the students. Some ways that um, we've continued to help support, of course, has been one-on-one -on -one trauma therapy. So we are continuing to use our behavioral health services. Um, we have been able to get all of our, um, almost all of our IBH clinicians back to a full-time um, schedule, which was really difficult when the, when the pandemic first um, started. So that's part of it. We've also been able to identify needs such as um, a need for food. So at Roosevelt, we have a huge population of newcomer families who, who we identified as having a huge need for food. And so something that the health center was able to do um, in our grant funding and budgeting was reallocate funds to be able to provide um, grocery store gift cards to families. Um, whereas before, we had a remote pantry in the clinic where we would just give out food directly, fr fresh fruit, vegetables, um, and of course like canned goods to families. So since we can't do that anymore, we were able to pivot and our funders allowed us to purchase grocery store gift cards, which has been um, phenomenal for families. They've really seen a difference. Um, and then another way that this team is really uh, supporting us 
um, and being able to connect with the school and maintain connection is that it serves as a space where um, staff can come together and share best practices, support one another, just talk about what's going on, talk about how we can improve distance learning and things like that. So I really just wanted to um, shout them out and say that the cost team at Roosevelt has been a huge help in the virtual transition. Um, and then moving to staff supports, these are some of our teacher champions who have um, championed the trauma-informed work in the classroom. Um, so outreach has been huge. So here I've divided it sort of into our campus community um, and then our partners and friends in the larger Oakland community who we tried to stay connected with. Um, and the campus community, of course, teachers, family, administrators, the cost team, health center, students, um, and then staying connected to our partners in the community has been really critical during this time to be able to connect students to resources. Um, there are so many organizations in Oakland that are providing resources to families and students that us as the health center, we think that's really important that we stay connected with those organizations, stay up to date with the, the kinds of services they're providing. Um, where they're located, how they're getting resources out to family. And likewise, they've also been able to share the same information about the health center, the services we're providing, the resources we have, how we can be reached and get that out to their network as well. So that's been key. Um, and then as far as on, on campus, um, some things virtually that have really supported the health center have been the advisory classes that students have with, with teachers. It's sort of uniform across all grade levels. Um, so we've been able to get out announcements there, including re, uh, resources in the community and services being offered in the clinic to make sure that students are staying connected. Google Classroom has been another one, of course. So, now that we're in distance learning, teachers are utilizing that tool, I believe a lot more. And so they can make a quick post on Google Classroom that shares our information and services. Um, there are also different bulletins that go out at various school sites. So we make sure that we include our information on there um, and that everything's up to date so that when those bulletins are shared weekly, families are getting the information, students are getting the information. Um, and social media has also uh, been another huge way for us to stay connected. Um, we've really, in the, in the La Clinica SBHCs, we've really been trying to build out our social network. Um, I think at this time, five of our eight clinics have started an Instagram page. And so I'm sure you guys know kids are all over Instagram. Um, and that is a huge platform for them. So for us to be able to connect in that way, it's like a quick and easy way for students to get information. Um, and then something else I wanted to mention, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, when we go into student supports, but the Health Center at Roosevelt has also started a Google Classroom and it's really student led. Um, but we being able to have our own Google Classroom kind of puts us in a position to show that we are part of the community, we're not a separate entity, um, and that we are supporting the school in every way that we can with distance learning. Um, and I think, did I miss one? Staff supports, yes. Um, so these really stem from the foundation that Sarah shared with you all. And I think us being able to support staff during this time, if we didn't have like an already established connection and relationship with the school site, it would be really, really difficult um, to communicate with them and collaborate on what their needs are. Um, and so this year, um, since the fall, since we started school in August, um, what, what I've been doing as the clinic supervisor is partnering with COST, partnering with our restorative justice coordinator to really identify what staff uh, needs right now. And I feel like because of COVID and because of the sharp transition to distance learning, it's really changing all of the time. Um, and so 
one of the tools that we use to sort of gauge this um, is that we recently partnered with the restorative justice coordinator to form a staff wellness survey that went out. Um, and so we're, we're still receiving um, responses from that, but it's, it's really helping us to gauge what staff think that they can use during this time. Um, and so it's, um, it's really helping to identify tools that can be used that are that are obviously going to be different from what we were doing in person. So when we were in person, we were able to have a cohort, those process groups that Sarah mentioned, um, and things like that. Um, but because of this wellness survey, we've identified that staff are actually feeling really overwhelmed right now. And so they don't feel like they have the capacity necessarily to take part in a cohort this year. Um, or have time to do a process group once a week or once a month. So some of the things that they've identified as being helpful are collaboration opportunities. Um, so hopefully we will be able to work with the cost team and work with restorative justice to be able to create more time for teachers to collaborate with one another, as well as other school staff, which right now during distance learning, they don't feel like they're getting a lot of that. So the way that the clinic will support um, is either holding space um, or like Sarah mentioned, being able to stipend teachers for their time. Um, and so we hope to do that. Um, and then the raffle and goodie bags, these are just ways to celebrate staff, um, to celebrate teachers and all of the hard work that they're doing. So we are putting together wellness goodie bags uh, for them. And then our restorative justice coordinator is holding um, a monthly raffle for staff where they'll receive useful tools to work from home, such as an ergonomic chair, um, yoga mats, and things like that. And then as we receive more feedback from the survey, we'll be able to identify more things that will be useful for them. There we are. Um, and then student support. Um, so this is a really big focus for us. Um, and again, for those of you who attended the conference, some of this is review. Um, but right now we hold the question, how do we access our students um, to be able to support their transition, bridge them to resources and continue to cultivate meaningful relationships with them. So. As all of you, I'm, I'm sure know, it's, it's been a challenge to cultivate a virtual space for students. Um, I think a lot of the challenges that teachers are seeing even are that, you know, they're showing up on Zoom, but they don't wanna interact or show their faces um, and things like that. So the health center is really trying to support the school in cultivating those virtual spaces. Um, before we get really into that, um, some of the adaptations we've made, like I mentioned, are telehealth. So I just wanted to share some of the tools that we've used and developed for telehealth. Um, here at La Clinica, across all eight school-based health sites, we have something called a triage line. So students from across all eight sites and the schools that those eight sites serve are able to call into a triage line to schedule an appointment. Um, this can be a med appointment, a health ed appointment, an appointment for behavioral health services with their provider. Um, and this has been really useful for us in just creating like a central location where students can access the services that we offer without trying to figure out which site do I call, who's open, who's closed, what if the site at my school is closed. Um, so we provided this number to all of the schools that we serve. Um, we also, like I mentioned, are still offering behavioral health services. Uh, we've also created a virtual clinic tour. So um, our admin assistant in partnership with a, a number of roles here, MAs and HSSs, have created a video tour of the three of our clinics that are open, which is really cool um, and is on YouTube. I can share the link with you all. Um, they created a virtual tour of the clinic so students can see what we're doing here, um, what the clinic looks like, what we offer, and then we have 
folks from each role talk a little bit about the services that we offer and how they can be accessed. Um, and then we've also recently created an appointment request form. Um, we know that students sometimes um, are shy or uncomfortable accessing people over the phone um, or online in a video format. So we've created a Google form that allows them to request an appointment and we call them back within one to two days of them submitting that form in order to schedule their appointment. Um, the clinic tour and the appointment re request form, these are links that we share to the Instagram so that they're also easily accessible for students. Um, and then in terms of um, services, we are also piloting virtual adolescent screening visits. So typically we do screening visits in person um, and we have a group of students come into the clinic and get um, familiar with the services that we offer. They have a mini visit. Um, but since we're not able to do that right now, what we're trying to do is pilot a virtual screening visit. Um, and so how that's working is that the health educators are doing outreach in Zoom classes. So they'll get a time slot um, and that's organized with the staff and, and admin at the schools. They'll get time to present in a Zoom class um, where they can talk about our services and then obtain consent forms from the students to access services. Um, and then each student is scheduled for a 30 minute introductory telehealth appointment. Um, and so that we are very hopeful about the outcome of the virtual adolescent screening visits. And this is also a way for us to make sure that we are not letting students fall through the cracks. Um, I'm sure all of you have had the experience that it's really difficult to maintain that connection with our patients. Um, and some of them we are losing track of. So with this, we're hoping that students will be able to access the resources and we'll hit every student in the school. Um, and then these are other things that I'm really excited for. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, there was some student-led mental health um, projects last year. And so this year, we actually lost our health educator at Roosevelt. Uh, but she left us with a really amazing gift, which is a grant from the city of Oakland that supports this student-led group. Um, and it's called the Mental Health Ally Project. So students, um, this year we were able to reform with the support of our IBH at Roosevelt um, and form a small cohort of six students who continue to celebrate mental health allies and awareness and build out platforms. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a moment. Um, and then the other thing we're doing, and maybe Sarah can chime in a little bit about this because this was an idea of hers, is that we are providing distance gifts to students. Um, so despite school closure, we still want to maintain a healthy relationship with our patients. And one way we thought of doing this was by providing them with the tools that they might have in a real life therapy session. So we're sending out things like headphones, art supplies, um, and different workbooks and things that will help them. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about those goodie bags that we're sending to students? Yeah, sure. So um, what we've learned from doing visits with young folks um, in the clinic is that one of the one of the major issues is that um, a lot of us are in really small spaces without private areas to really be talking. Um, and so in order to kind of improve some of that, we're including, um, we're sending out headphones that have like a microphone so that we can't guarantee that, that someone in your house can't hear you, but at least like whatever's being said back is, is private and you're able to maintain some sense of privacy that way. It's also helping with the connection issues. Um, having headphones is really helping with the clarity of understanding when there's a bad internet connection. Um, so that's going in there. And then just, yeah, like Nessa said, including um, some of the tools that we usually have in the therapy room. Um, and so, you know, that might be like a notebook with something to write with it. It's going to be like um, some really basic art supplies, um, a stress ball, 
um, a fidget, and then also uh, the little zine that has some self-care strategies and like what can you do in the moment when you're having a really hard time, um, just to normalize for, for young folks that right now is challenging for a lot of us um, and to give them some tools um, to add to their toolkits at home. A lot of them have exhausted their resources at home and just having a little something extra um, to ground them can be really useful and can also be useful as I'm doing therapy sessions to be able to teach someone progressive muscle relaxation and have a stress ball with them to actually practice it can be helpful as well. And it also just messages that, you know, a, a sense of care and um, connection with kids. Um, you know, I'm running right now a, a virtual trauma group and we sent them binders with all of the, you know, color worksheets in them and some fidgets and things. But the thing they were most excited about were snacks and like there weren't that many in there, but they just were really excited that someone had thought about them and had included snacks that they would like. And so just thinking about ways that we can support young people in feeling like there are people outside of their homes that continue to care about them in the middle of all of this. Um, you know, for all of us, it's hard right now. And for young people, especially like time feels especially like this is never going to end. I think it feels like that for most people right now. But for young people, this is feeling like earth shattering. And yeah. so anything to help connect them to to other folks is useful. Yes. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and then I'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about this mental health ally project. Um, so I mentioned that our health educator last year, she applied for a grant through the city of Oakland that would allow us to fund this group, um, stipend students, and then also allow them space to create t-shirts. So before I get into that, I'll talk a little bit about what the group is. Um, so it's a peer health education group. Right now we reformed in the fall because the students who were part of the group last year graduated. Um, so we reformed and we have five students this year. Um, and what they've done is they've established a system where um, folks across campus, including teachers, staff, and anyone else who's part of the Roosevelt campus can be nominated as a mental health ally. Um, and the way that structured was totally up to the students. Um, and so we meet once a week virtually. Um, we try to make it as engaging as possible with the students. We play games. We use Google Jamboard um, to um, interact with one another and share the things that we're looking at. Um, and we use Google Classroom as a tool. And so these students came up with a system of how to nominate folks on campus in order to celebrate mental health and also share resources and content that is related to self-care. Um, and so what these students identified as a mental health ally, um, they identified the qualities and characteristics of what that means. Some of those things included folks being compassionate, understanding, um, able to support one another, encouraging, able to give advice, um, and things like that. And then they created a Google form where you can nominate um, anyone on campus. So the goal for us is that eventually everyone on campus will be nominated as a mental health ally. And that's just a way to really uplift mental health um, and self-care, especially during this time, like Sarah mentioned. For students, it sort of feels like it's never going to end and they're going to be at home indefinitely. Um, and so we just wanted to really create fun ways for them to engage with each other and continue to celebrate each other, even though they're not able to connect in person. Um, they're also creating some really cool social media content and flyers that promote wellness. Um, so for that, we're using the Canva website and we're able to use that for free. Students can hop on um, when we're on our Zoom classes every week. We take turns sharing our screen, showing our progress, and then hopefully by the end of the fall semester, we will have some refined content that we can share to social media. Um, and then the hope as well with this is that we will come out with a mental health club. Um, and we just received some more funding from Kaiser 
um, that will help us support this in stipending a staff member on campus who is not part of the health center of course, so that it can be sustainable in the future. Um, we'll stipend a staff member on campus to spearhead a mental health club. Um, and students in theory will continue with the same sort of work, creating content, celebrating one another, coming up with ways to identify self-care techniques and wellness activities virtually. Um, and also we have the funding to be able to create t-shirts um, so students also came up with a t-shirt design that's really awesome. We're finalizing it actually later today. Um, and then the health center will be ordering those t-shirts and mailing them out to folks who are nominated. Again, the goal is to get everyone on campus nominated as a mental health ally um, in order to create a really supportive uh, community. Um, also, as I mentioned, social media has been a huge, huge way that we've been able to stay connected with the youth. Um, we're continuing to use Instagram platform. As I mentioned, I think five of our eight school sites have an Instagram, so we're able to promote each other's content. This is also a huge way for the students to feel supported and create their own content. So we've noticed that the students love to see their own work celebrated on Instagram. So some of the flyers we have on there and information about wellness was totally created by the youth. Um, and, and to be able to see their peers being able to create something that we're sharing and celebrating um, has been really impactful to them. Um, we've also explored using YouTube. I mentioned that we have a virtual clinic tour. Um, so that's another social site that we're trying to use, um, as well as Google Classroom. Um, and then we just wanted to also um, identify some experts that we've learned from in doing this work. Um, as I mentioned, we are still learning um, we're going to see how the mental health club goes. The mental health ally project has been going well so far. Um, and we just wanted to celebrate those who have supported us in this work and who we learned from. Um, and we're going to open it up to question and answer. Thank you so much for listening and sharing. Yeah, definitely. If you have questions, you can drop them in the chat. Um, and also, if you have ideas about what you're doing in your school sites, um, in your school based health centers, I'm sure here. I'd love to hear that as well. So we have about 10 minutes if people want to um, drop it in the chat or um, you could also raise your hand and we can As someone asked for the link. I will share that. Uh, I think I shared it. And that's all. Oh, thanks, Sarah. I see your comment down there. Nessa, I just want to ask a question about the Mental Health Ally Project, if that's okay. Sounds super exciting to me. Um, is there a curriculum you're running off of, or how do you design what you do in each of the meetings? Is, is it youth-led, facilitator-led? Yeah, so for the most part, it's youth-led. Um, some of the feedback we've gotten from school staff um, is that the kids are feeling really overwhelmed with the amount of work that they have and also not being able obviously to engage in person. So we didn't wanna make it too curriculum heavy um, and add more to their plate. We've left it pretty open for them to lead. And so far they've been doing a really great job in stepping up to that. Um, what we, how we do structure it at the beginning, we'll play a virtual game to get everyone comfortable with each other. So we've played like hangman, we've done breakout groups to play rock, paper, scissors. Um, we always have a check-in question that's youth centered and really inquiring about how the kids are feeling. Um, and then we leave it open to them. So we, um, in the beginning, did some trauma one-on-one -on -one with them just for them to be able to identify what trauma looks like. Um, and then we really left it open to asking the youth, what does mental health mean to you? Um, and what are ways that we can support one another's mental health? Um, and they really took it over from there. I think at first we were worried about participation and you know not being able to see everyone's face and things like that, but they've just done an outstanding job 
identifying what mental health means, identifying ways that they feel are critical in supporting one another. Um, and I think they really love the creative aspect where they're able to design their own Google form, design their own flyers in Canva, um, and now a t-shirt design. They've, they've just been incredibly supportive of one another. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you, it's very cool. If anybody else has some questions, you can feel free to type them in the chat. Yes, yeah, so we'd love to hear from you all. Even if you guys are doing some things at your clinics um, to support virtual learning and virtual wellness, we'd love to hear what everyone's doing um, and just get a sense of more ideas um, and things we can implement. I just had another question about the well, so the wellness survey that you sent out to staff. Um, it sounds like it's it's gone out recently and you're just getting feedback back, back from it, but I'm wondering, was that something that you guys created or is there a tool out there that you um, pulled from to make the wellness survey? Um, for this one, we actually partnered with one of the staff on campus, so the restorative justice coordinator. Um, and what we did was we had a phone call together and sort of talked about what kinds of questions we want to ask the staff. Um, some of them I believe she had used in previous years, so she included those. Um, things like how do you feel about culture and climate at the school, what supports you could use. Um, and then what, what I added in there um, in terms of ways that the health center can support is how, how would you like to be supported? What are some tools that we can provide you with to make your experience better with distance learning? Um, what ways can we celebrate you? What kinds of things would you like to see in a staff raffle? Um, and so we really kind of just sat there and dished it out and came up with it together. Thank you. Um, let's see some questions. Are there any SBHCs in Contra Costa Unified, Richmond, San Paolo? That's good. Um, that is I, a good question. It is. And there are um, school based health centers. And so, um, Ashley, if you want to, I don't know them off the top of my head, but if you want to um, email me, I will share my screen now with the. Um, Great. Let me stop sharing. <laughs> there um, we go. Cool. Then um, I can give you that information after this. Um, thank you. And there's my email there. That's a great question. If there are any other questions, now's your chance. Okay, well, Vanessa and Sarah, thank you both so much for sharing um, with us today. You guys have shared some really great information. Oh, it looks like there's, can't see the chat. Can you guys see the chat? Yes, just a thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you guys so much. And uh, we really appreciate it. And um, like I said, this will be recorded and on our, our website and we'll share the um, PowerPoint afterwards and please reach out um, if you have any other questions. Yes, thank you all so much for attending and holding space for us. Thank you all. Thanks, Guy. Good to see you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Nessa. Bye. Bye.